And it's great honor to be here at this forum. Uh, and I just, when I heard that Teachers was formed in 1918, that was the same year that the Foreign Policy Association was formed. So a lot of great ideas happened at the same time. Um, so what we're going to do at this conference, uh, we have uh, Archie Cox, Henry Coffin, and Bill Priest. And we're going to begin this session on Wall Street with a short presentation by Henry Coffin. And then he'll take a seat back, and then we'll have uh, some other discussions and some presentations. And then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. And we guarantee we will end on time. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce Henry Kaufman to uh, start the program off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about an important issue that is sitting in front of us, and that is financial concentration and regulatory reform. The most severe financial crisis since the Great Depression damaged not only the financial system, but also the larger economy. On the financial side, the worst may be over. But there is no guarantee of sustained economic growth, no guarantee that markets will not be shaken again in the next few years. To minimize the chance of a near future as bleak as the recent past, we must put in place rules of behavior for private sector financial institutions, along with reformed financial supervision that can ensure really such rules are followed. There are many proposals in circulation today, but so far, very little action has been taken. Now today, I want to focus on a critical need in new regulation that has gotten far too little attention among policymakers and pundits. That is, the current and the future role of financial conglomerates, or as some call them, integrated financial institutions. As debt has grown exponentially uh, in the United States, and as the financial system has teetered and collapsed, Financial authorities have given most of their attention to financial instruments, such as derivative, mortgage-backed securities, and credit default swaps, and relatively little to the structure of dominant financial institutions. While most have been watching one drama, a second drama play has continued to unfold on the same stage to little notice, the unprecedented consolidation of behemoth financial conglomerates. Massive financial concentration seemed quite unlikely in the early post-World War II years. The Great Depression that followed the speculative excesses of the 1920s inspired sweeping political backlash. Congress passed a wave of very tough legislation that constrained financial institutions, chiefly banks, within specified markets and segregated them from many activities. Financial conglomerates not only became unfashionable, but they had been outlawed. For their part, senior management at most leading financial institutions still recalled vividly the harrowing banking failures and massive debt write-offs of the Depression years. It was reasonable to expect that financial spe specialization with its segmented and well-defined borders would be there forever. The consolidation of the American financial markets increased gradually, almost, I would say, imperceptibly, in the 1960s and 1970s. It centered mainly on the mergers of banking institutions, especially among deposit-type institutions such as commercial banks, savings and loan association, and savings banks. Many of the institutions that lost their independence through mergers had fallen victim to excessively liberal lending practices, a harbinger of the future. The competitive pressures in the late 1970s and 1980s led to a wave of deregulation that essentially dismantled the New Deal era of regulatory regime. 
By the 1990s, financial concentration reached a tidal wave proportion. The linchpin was the abandonment of the Glass-Steagall Act, which had kept most financial business separate. At the time, official supervisors and regulators didn't seem to grasp the ramification from the risk contagion to conflict of interest of lowering the firewalls between financial sectors. Now consider just some of the data on recent financial consolidation. As recently as 1990, the 10 largest financial companies held about 10% of US financial assets. <clears throat> Today, they hold at least 60%. The share controlled by the 20 largest has grown during the same period from 12% to nearly 80%. Of the 15 largest US financial institutions in 1991, all but five have lost their independence as they were merged into survivors. Today, only two investment banks remain even as they are sheltered by a legal structure supported by the Federal Reserve. Back in 1990, there were more than 15,000 FDIC insured banks since then, failures and mergers into larger institutions has cut that more than in half. Today, large financial conglomerates are so diverse and so integrated that to classify them, to classify them along what I would call traditional lines as commercial banks, insurance companies, or investment banks would be highly misleading. Many provide deposit facilities within their own holding company. Quite a few are active in the US and market and abroad in a wide range of activities that include investment banking, the trading of securities, proprietary trading, insurance, money market funds, and money management itself. Now, in light of the developments that have occurred, what have we learned really from the prevail of the last couple of years? There are several conclusions that I believe are undisputable. First, large financial institutions did not anchor, were not an anchor of stability in our financial system. It seems fair to say that if the federal government had not provided enormous <laughs> amount of direct and indirect financial support in key markets, all of them would have failed. Even the healthiest ones would have been pulled down by their interconnection with weaker players. And that collapse, in turn, would have been followed by a harrowing economic depression. Second, the top firms drove the credit creation process with great ingenuity and force. Their, their large and skilled management teams were at the forefront of securitization propelling markets for derivatives, credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities, and other exotic instruments to an unprecedented scale and to new levels of risk. They also played a central role in popularizing quantitative risk analysis techniques, techniques that rather than controlled risk, tended to encourage risk-taking and contribute to the debt overload in our system. And third, I think we should recognize that leading financial conglomerates played a central role in shifting the concept of liquidity, the one that was based asset on, on the asset side, to the liability side of the balance sheet. Years ago, liquidity at business corporations meant the size of liquid assets, the maturity of receivables, the turnover of inventory, and the relationship of their assets to liabilities. For households, it primarily meant the maturing, the maturing assets being held for contingency. But in recent decades, liquidity has increasingly come to mean access to credit, access to borrowing. The dominant conglomerate financials were instrumental in this transformation by aggressively marketing credit cards, by popularizing an array of new liberal mortgage financing techniques, and by spinning off many risky business and household assets into, into subsidiaries 
or securitizing them. The risk-taking strategies and tactics of financial giants were not the sole cause of the crisis of 2007 and beyond. Much of that damage could have been prevented by effective regulatory oversight. It's widely acknowledged that the financial regulatory system itself has become anachronistic in an age of diversified conglomerates. But even within this framework system, key players failed to act decisively and effectively, and none more so than the Federal Reserve. Under the current system, the Fed is the primary guardian of our financial system with its power to raise and lower interest rates, primarily through open market purchases and sales of securities, the Fed has enormous influence over the growth of debt. But in recent decades, the central bank failed to adequately restrain the growth of debt. It allowed debt to grow much more rapidly than gross national product. For a variety of reasons, Fed officials did not understand the powerful role that financial innovation, such as securitization and the derivative revolution, would play in propelling the growth of debt. Monetary policy might have curbed many of these potential market excesses. The Fed also failed to recognize that abandoning the Glass-Steagall Act, that would accelerate financial concentration and create more institutions deemed too big to fail. It is revealing that the Fed officials never publicly admitted that large institutions were too big to fail until the current credit crisis took hold. The prevailing philosophy for a long while among central bankers was that markets would discipline leading institutions as shareholders and some creditors would suffer losses and managements would be removed. But as we learned, the hard way during the past year or so, market discipline is not enough. Some institutions are too big to fail, and by the time they reach that point, they have piled up a massive excess debt on the public and seriously <coughs> weakened the credit structure. Now, this doesn't mean that markets don't work any more than is, it means that only markets work. The challenge is to strike a right balance in financial markets between entrepreneurial drive and fiduciary responsibility. By its very nature, the fiduciary role in our financial system must fall chiefly on government. Financial institutions will always push to the edge of risk taking. When they innovate, profitability competitors will imitate. There's no copyright or patent on most financial innovations. Therefore, firms often seek profits through new trading techniques and new ways of increasing leverage, uh, new and growth through acquisitions and diversification. It's therefore the job of the government to set prudent rules of financial behavior. In recent decades, leading financial institutions, the Fed and other regulatory bodies alike were caught up in the financial libertarian view that most who perform well will fail and those who will do well will prosper. As Chuck Prince, former head of Citi, said several years ago, as long as the music plays, Citi will be on the dance floor. What he meant was, as long as the Federal Reserve supplied funds, Citi would push <laughs> hard to employ them. And if not, Citi would lose market share or might not be able to pay competitive employee salary or might not generate enough earnings to satisfy stockholders. That view engulfed all large financial institutions. And on the regulatory side, economic libertarianism was an important force behind the demise of the Glass-Steagall Act in the 1990s. Now, unless our government acts to reverse the rapid growth of financial bigness, financial concentration even, will increase even more. It seems likely that with the growing acceptance and popularity of too big to fail, some firms will consolidate in order to find safe harbor under the government protective wing. 
but greater concentration would be quite harmful to our financial markets and our economy. To begin with, in recent events have taught us that financial conglomerates are very difficult to manage. Second, financial consolidation will continue to undermine competition in financial markets. Leading conglomerates already control huge shares in key sectors of our markets. They're deeply entrenched, engaged in both the buy side as well as the same side, as the sell side of transaction. They're underwriters and they are also institutional investors and portfolio managers and, on both, and also financial advisors. Third, diversified financial firms that engage in proprietary trading are rife with conflicts of interest. In this typically highly leveraged activity, they garner information from their huge volume of client activity, insights to which other participants are not privy. It's a kind of inside information. Moreover, many financial holding companies house deposit institutions and benefit from the association with the deposit facility when they carry on proprietary trading. Again, the recent financial crisis revealed fissures in the system. The government should halt proprietary trading and other highly leveraged activities of many conglomerates, in part because of their guaranteed deposit operations. And fourth, greater financial concentration will significantly <clears throat> impede the marketability of all securities. With fewer market makers, dealers, and underwriters, financing costs will increase, and spreads for security trading in the market will ultimately widen. The greater concentration of financial markets, the greater will be the swing in financial asset prices. The lack of diversity within markets will bring with it sharp shifts in market prices over time. As noticeable in recent years, this will become a global phenomenon. Financial conglomerates have a global reach. A sixth damaging effect of financial consolidation, perhaps the most important of all, is its role in pushing our political economy from economic democracy to whatever imperfect action is it may have to a more socialized system. In an economy with highly concentrated financial sectors, the government will remain a powerful force in the allocation of credit, as we saw, have seen in the current crisis. Even for those who support such intervention, assumed, they assume it would be temporary. The risk is that temporary emergency measures will become permanent. Although Congress is devoting a lot of attention to health care reform, financial reform will also figure prominently in the months ahead. This legislation, from my perspective, may take several directions. One would be to transform the largest, the too big to fail conglomerates, into a financial public utilities kind of organizational structure. This could entail limits on profits, for instance, or higher capital requirements than their smaller counterparts. In addition, such firms might be required to maintain an equity interest in the instruments they securitize and reserves against derivatives they originate. They also may be prohibited from proprietary trading. This is probably not the best way to go. Giant conglomerates almost surely will continue to dominate financial scene from time to time. When markets roil again in the future, some financial firms will merge again in order to be too big to fail. Alternatively, regula regula regulators might require the largest financial conglomerates to spin off a significant proportion of their assets. So what remains would not be too big to fail. But I doubt Congress will legislate such action. Not surprisingly, the urgency to act decisively I think has waned somewhat as the business recession shows signs of easing and security markets are bouncing back. But financial concentration and all the serious risk that imposes to our financial markets and our economic democracy may have merely paused to catch a breath. Without real reform to rein in excessive financial behavior, we continue to risk the kind of financial upheaval 
that could lead to even greater socialization of our financial system. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, yeah. Thank you, Henry. Now, Bill Priest will make a few comments. Again, thank all of you for coming, and uh, the opportunity to interact with my panel members is a, is a pleasure. Uh, I think Henry is one of the great sages in the world of economics and finance. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, many of my comments are going to parallel his, so I'll shorten some of those. Um, I'll start off with the idea that in many respects what we just went through is uh, of enormous significance. Uh, it's, uh, a year ago we were looking over an abyss, uh, and if we had Armageddon, we were approaching it when the TED spread, which is a measure of liquidity, the Treasury Euro dollar spread hit 450, 460 basis points just about a year ago. Uh, if there was going to be the end of the world, that was uh, about to uh, foresee that. Um, but we aren't. And frankly, the TED spread today is 19 basis points. The liquidity storm that we face is essentially over in that respect. There are other storms that we're dealing with, but unfortunately, I think the feel good of the reflation in the financial markets through the lowering of the credit spreads uh, have made uh, some of Henry's comments particularly relevant. We cannot lose sight of what happened. Uh, it was really pretty awful, and it was as close to uh, uh, the end of uh, the world as we know it, as could ex be experienced. And one of my suggestions, or actually already is, I saw in the New York Times, but I, I had a meeting about two weeks ago with a couple of people in, the, in government. I really do think you need the equivalent of a 9-11 commission to kind of look at what happened over the last decade or so. There's lots of blame to, to uh, place here. Um, you can look at government policy, Federal Reserve policy, the role of banks, the role of compensation systems in banks. There's an awful lot of stuff that came together to uh, indicate the uh, size and seriousness of this problem. And again, just to give you a little evolution of an aspect of it, because I, I think much of what uh, Henry said is absolutely true. If you're going to have this commission, he should be a member. Uh, I think uh, he reflects uh, an awful lot of unpolitical insight. He's not a politically correct person. That's good. And uh, I think what you need are truth tellers. There are too few truth tellers in the financial system today. So let's just take a little bit of a look at the evolution of investment banking. And Henry alluded to this in his comment. The investment banking model, uh, in many respects, after 1929 or so, and Glass-Steagall having been passed in 1933, you had a separation of commercial banking and investment banking because we had a near disaster at that time in the financial world as well. The investment banks were essentially private partnerships at that time. They were advisors to industry. They provided advice. They did underwritings. They did M&A suggestions. They were essentially handmaidens to industry. The investment bank in the 1930s looks nothing like the investment banks today. Uh, actually, there's not any left, according to that model, which I'll, I'll walk through. Mm -hmm. But what we see today is a lot of prop desk trading, the conflicts of interest that uh, Henry alluded to, all very present. Well, what changed from that, that period in the 30s to today? Let's start with a concept of OPM, other people's money. The, in, in the 60s, Donaldson Lufkin went public. And what happened with that, them, that when they came public, essentially you had the uh, input of outside capital, shareholder money, was permanent capital. You essentially, you lower the cost of capital to this industry in that process. It made it easier to grow. You could become a little more aggressive. Risk was essentially shared by management ownership and uh, public ownership. That's all well and good. But it also set the stage for some conflicts we'll all get into. But OPM, to me, was the first stage. The second stage was the development of derivatives. Now, the explosion of, of new tools for hedging risk, taking, uh, taking risk, arbitrage, and on and on, all came out of the application of derivatives. In many respects, uh, Myron Scholes, Fisher Black, and Bob Merton uh, split the atom. It could do a lot of very, very good things, and it could do a lot of very, very bad things. Uh, w Warren Buffett has called them weapons of mass, uh, mass destruction, financial weapons of mass destruction. But the instruments themselves were not the problem. 
It was the leverage that got placed in them, the opaqueness and the misuse potential proved to be the problem. So you had OPM, you had the Black-Scholes option theory in the mid-60s. Most of the people that were running banks at that time had no clue what that development would lead to. Then you had the issue of leverage. Now, leverage was built into the system, and you can't blame all the banks. You can, you can take a look at what happened between 1980 and 2000. Essentially, between 1980 and 2000, interest rates fell over 1,000 basis points. We had the great moderation. Central bankers got to be pretty full of themselves in terms of we have tamed the business cycle. We don't have a problem. That was rather foolish, particularly if you look at a period of 100 years rather than just uh, 20 years. Um, risk was in. The 1960-80 period of risk avoidance with all of its problems gave way to a significant attraction to risk. And frankly, if you were running a bank and you looked around and you saw, you know what, the world is less risky. Uh, volatility is coming down. We can actually put more risk. If you leverage up, your return on equity goes up, stocks will go up. Let's, let's start to practice that. Essentially, there was a, this was a combination of what was going on in business, the Federal Reserve, and now the emergence of a compensation model. Now, the new business model in investment banks, by the time we got the, the 90s in particular, was this. You know, I think about 50% of revenues ought to go to comp. Then we have SG&A, the rest will go to our shareholders. But let's see, the more revenues, the more comp. Put in a little leverage, we've got more revenues, we've got more comp. Essentially, as this was going on, you started to have the beginning of a systemic problem in the banking system. But it was really coming out of what was amounting to a laissez-faire capitalistic system. Capitalism is not going away. All the other isms have proven to be uh, uh, much less attractive. But the kind of capitalism we had, the laissez-faire capitalism to me, basically failed us. But it wasn't all by itself. It had to do with a government policy. But anyway, we had this new business policy, and lo and behold, uh, we have, in 1999, we have the passage that is the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, and I completely agree with what Henry said in terms of the effect of that. Repeal of Glass-Steagall was done under the guise of, you know what, these European banks and the universal banking model, they're far superior to what our poor guys are doing. Our poor commercial bankers can't do the investment banking. The investment banking wanted to do what the commercial banking people wanted to do, too. So in many respects, Bob Rubin, whether knowledgeably or unknowledgeably, essentially was a lobbyist for the banking system. One week after the passage of that uh, repeal, I think Bob took a job at, uh, at Citibank as vice chairman, probably one of the shortest job interview processes I'm familiar <laughs> with. Um, but at this point, investment banks and commercial banks could merge. But there was one big difference. Commercial banks essentially are deposit-based institutions. Investment banks are wholesale financed institutions. It only works if you have confidence. So through commercial paper and the ability to roll over commercial paper, that was what the issue was. Once there was no confidence in that, in that segment of the market, there really was credit gridlock. You had investment banks such as Lehman leverage 40 to one. They had leverage, they had toxic assets, and basically it was game over for the investment banking model. The investment banking model, as existed two years ago, is gone. It doesn't exist. You had huge leverage, these toxic assets, faulty ratings by agencies, and short-term credit markets all produced game over. But to Henry's point, and it's actually a quote I have in a paper coming out, the quote uh, by Prince was actually a realistic quote. If you think of what the essence of the banks are, it really is to maximize the profitability for the uh, owners of the business. That's the charge. So it's, it, you, they behaved as you would have thought. The problem is we also had a backdrop of government policy through deregulation, the role of Fed, and Alan, Greensburg, Alan Greenspan having essentially telegraphing the, the, what's called, was then called the uh, uh, Greenspan put. You essentially had a put to big problems. This encouraged risk taking. It wasn't that the government caused the problem, but they permitted it through 20 years of behavior Democrats and Republicans, but there was a 20-year period where there was permission. Deregulation was in, laissez-faire capitalism was in, self-regulation was in, and then if you were running a company, even if you thought you saw a problem, the reality is there was a race to the bottom. You had no choice. If you were gonna compete with the guys who were more risk takers, you had to be in that same situation. 
So in many respects, the government policy through 30 years of deregulation and faulty Fed policy provided the backdrop for this problem. The incentive systems that were embedded in a laissez-faire capitalism and self-regulation was the match that lit the tinder that was provided by government policy. There are so many elements of this, and it's so complicated. I really do think we'd all benefit from having a 9-11 commission or the equivalent thereof. You don't want to make rash decisions in a short period of time. But it happened after the period in the 29-30 period when the Congress set up the PCORA Commission. Uh, you've had, but you really, it needs to be serious. You need to have serious truth tellers on there. And the last thing you need to have an open democracy is to have a concentration in the financial system. Gigantism, which is certainly, and I agree with Henry on this point, gigantism is certainly anti-democracy. And in the long run, it's not going to be good for America and uh, the values that we, uh, we have. So I will stop there and Great. turn it over to Archie. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm in, in, I think I'm in the camp where same place Bill is, and that is that, that one, one, one thing is very clear, what we shouldn't do is act precipitously, uh, which I think there's a tendency to do and which we've done in the past in, in various things. And, and uh, there are an awful lot of legitimate questions about, about uh, both about what happened, about the role of different institutions, uh, the role of the regulators, uh, changes in legislation, and so forth. And, the protection of depositors. Do you ring fence deposits or don't you ring fence deposits? Uh, do, you, do you set the question of whether you, whether you try to turn the clock back and reinstitute a Glass-Steagall type of thing? I think those are all legitimate questions. I, I think that they can't be answered. There is no simple answer to them. And uh, I, I, I personally think it's too late to turn the clock back uh, on Glass-Steagall. Uh, I think that uh, size has become a problem. The too big to fail is a problem. I think there's some interesting potential solutions out there, uh, such as has been suggested in the UK, where, where the large uh, financial institutions have, in effect, living wills, uh, that if they, if they get into a position where they, they are failing, uh, there is a wind-down mechanism, uh, wh which is an interesting concept, <laughs> rather than simply getting government support uh, and carrying on. Uh, I think that's worth, worth looking at. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to condemn uh, uh, derivatives. It's easy to condemn compensation. It's, it's easy to condemn a, a variety of different things. Um, but I don't think that, that, that those that condemn always fully understand the role they play. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not clear, for instance, that credit default swaps uh, played much of a role in, in, in what happened. In, in fact, when, when Lehman Brothers and, and General Motors uh, went broke, uh, settling out credit default swaps wasn't a problem. Uh, settling most, most derivatives, I, I, think, I think the debate going on in derivatives is an interesting one, uh, and I think there is some merit to, to uh, central clearing uh, bodies, to exchange trading uh, of standardized derivatives. But how you define standardized derivatives, and, and the devil's in the detail, as usual, and, and the unintended consequences of very, various actions is what we, we need to worry about and fully understand. Uh, what's standard and what's non-standard when it comes to a, to, to a, to a contract? Uh, what's the impact on the, on the not the dealer, who, who, who may be perfectly happy to list uh, to, and clear through central clearing body, uh, standardized contracts, but what's the uh, impact on the clients, on the people who are using hedging uh, as a mechanism for funding themselves? And, and I, I like to cite the example of the mid-cap, uh, uh, medium-sized uh, exploration and production companies that use hedging as a, as a method of raising capital. Um, we, we will we have outstanding, I would say, between 10 and $15 billion of, of exposure through hedges to mid-cap oil and gas companies in the United States. Uh, the, if, if those companies had to, and, and, and similarly, we deal with uh, government uh, institutions, producers, such as, such as Mexico. 
uh, if they had to list their con had, if they had to clear their contracts through a central clearing organization, they would have to put up post collateral whenever the price of oil or gas went up, whatever they had hedged. They don't have collateral. The mid cap size companies don't have collateral. Where are they going to get the money? They're the ones doing all the all the energy exploration in this country. Uh, the majors have abandoned this country onshore for practical purposes. Uh, you'd take away a huge uh, amount of employment and, and, a, and a potent, you know, something that contributes to the solution of, of our energy problem if you forced the companies themselves to clear through central clearing organizations. Uh, we, would, we and others in the industry would never lend the amount of money to these companies that we're, that, that we're prepared to have as exposure uh, through, through hedging transactions where we have security of the reserves. And if the price of the reserves go up, they don't have to post collateral. We're perfectly happy because the value of, of the reserves has gone up. So uh, things like that, it, the, dev, it, the, the devil's in the detail. People don't understand and don't, don't, don't get into the detail. Just a comment on, on, I think, two things I might say without taking too much time. Size and compensation, uh, the latter a particular hot button, uh, and, and maybe regulation, briefly. There will be more regulation. There should be more regulation. I think regulation has failed. Uh, again, we need to get it right, um, and, and, uh, and, and that's part of the debate that's going on right now. I hope, I hope it's a sensible debate and people don't act too quickly. Uh, on size, um, yes, I agree with some of the things that Bill said. Uh, having been at Morgan Stanley during the time when we debated going public, which, which uh, was in 1986, uh, we could not accumulate capital and grow fast enough to serve our clients and compete with, with other institutions uh, without uh, going public and raising outside funds. Now. It was at that time that the model of, of paying out roughly 50% of revenues in compensation was established. Uh, is it right that that same model exists today when, when revenues are many multiples of what they were then uh, and the institutions are many sizes of what they were then? I think that's a fair question to ask, uh, but, but it's, it's still, still the model. Compensation itself um, and, and the size of the institution um, I would argue that, that while there has been no question, as Henry says, there's been concentration and, and the institutions have gotten bigger, so too have the clients that they serve. It, it seems to me in every industry there is a long-term trend towards concentration, whether it's the chemical industry or the energy industry or anything else. And, and, and you have to be bigger to serve your clients. So uh, in and of itself, there's a question of, of too big to fail and what do you do about it? And do you go the living will route? Do you go some other route? Um, I, I don't think we want to go the government owned and supported route, uh, even though we're there. We need to get out of that. Uh, compensation is a hot button. I think there too, there's no easy answers on compensation. Um, uh, you, you, can, you can, I've been the chairman of the compensation committee on publicly uh, listed companies, it's a very difficult task to align the interest of shareholders with management uh, and, and to reward for performance and particularly for performance versus their peers. Um, the level of compensation in many respects is, is uh, so structure of compensation is issue. I think we have it at Barclays pretty good. Uh, I think that, that there's others where places where it's not as good. But in any event, it needs to be looked at seriously. It's a, it's a, it's a real issue. Level of compensation, I have to say, is uh, uh, it's obviously an issue at the great extremes. Uh, there's some social questions, I think, that, that people raise that, that you can't ignore. Uh, but it's also a competitive issue, and not just a competitive issue among the financial institutions. If, 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 our, if we don't pay our best people who make the most money to us for us, uh, they will go so elsewhere, such as to hedge funds, and, uh, which are, are unregulated and where people make a lot more money than they make in, in, financial, in banks, frankly. Uh, so th th we can't just say people shouldn't get paid, uh, you know, whatever the amount is. Should people get paid $100 million a year? That's a different issue. Uh, that's, that gets to the corporate world as well, though, uh, mm -hmm. not just the financial institutional world. So a lot of questions, no easy answers. Uh, a lot of thought needs to be given, and 
uh, we don't need to act precipitously as, as we did with Sarbanes-Oxley, which was passed in three days without, I believe, a single corporate corporation commenting on it, uh, which, which in hindsight was a great mistake. Bill, you have a comment? The, the only, yeah, I, I agree with many of the things that Archie was saying. The problem with compensation structure is the asymmetric nature of them. When you place leverage in there, and you create an, a situation where an individual can win, but the firm or the industry or society loses, that's a problem. You've got to deal with this, this, this systemic effect that is embedded in leverage. It's, and you can look at it when you look at hedge funds or private equity people, for example. Uh, there's a fellow in, uh, in, in Boston who uh, has written a very nice paper on compensation systems of 2 and 20. It's very interesting. The 2% is very often justified. It's the asymmetric claim on profits with the 20% structure that is often the problem. And it's so one-sided in favor of the manager vis-a-vis -vis the client, you kind of wonder why people sign up for this. But it's a free world. There's full disclosure. There's consent. And disclosure and consent cover all the sins in the world, in my view. But, it, but still, you have to be very careful in the compensation structure with regard to the leverage embedded in there. I agree with that. I will say, though, one should not forget that pe people say that, well, if people own enough, have enough of an ownership interest, it'll, it'll be a mitigating factor to, to behavior. The people got, who got hurt worst, individuals who got hurt worst in, in, in what happened were the, were the CEOs of, of Lehman and Bear Stearns, uh, which in theory did a lot of what people are proposing gets done. Um, and, and maybe their stakes were too big, so it led to the wrong behavior. But they, they in fact, were doing what a lot of people were proposing, and, and it didn't help. Right. Uh, so there's no easy answers, again. Now, I, th I think at the individual level, all of this makes sense. The problem is when all the individuals start to behave a certain way, you have a systemic effect. You can't blame the individuals for behaving in what is the rational way for that particular model. It's just that government, and I do think regulation, failed miserably. Uh, they, they, were, they were gone. Uh, in, before the two or three days before Bear Stearns went under, uh, Christopher Cox uh, said, we're, we're totally comfortable with the um, uh, balance sheet of Bear Stearns. Where was he? When they went broke, they had a book value of $60. The day they went filed, they had $60 book value. It was zero. That's the reality. So there, there was an institutional failure at the, at the regulation of these institutions. But that is... You, you just can't go out and react to that. I do think this needs to be studied. And it sounds like it's deferring the problem, but it's not. You really need some thoughtful, reasoned people. The, the jurist uh, Posner, who uh, has written a fabulous book called Descent of uh, Capitalism, it's really worth reading. It'll give you another perspective. There are some very thoughtful people in this country on this issue. They don't really have an ax to grind. They just want the place to work better. And I think those are the people that should comprise uh, any commission we put together. Henry, do you think tactically, I mean, we'll talk broadly about uh, regulation. Do you think the government should regulate compensation of people who work in the financial industry? No, I don't think the government should regulate uh, compensation of people uh, working in institutions. But you can have a dampening impact of a significant magnitude if you increase the equity requirements in a business substantially and therefore you decrease the leveraging that goes on. Uh, a lot of the profits that have been garnered have occurred because of a massive amount of leveraging, meaning financial institutions have piled on a huge amount of debt of various magnitudes through all kinds of financial arrangements, on balance sheet, off balance sheet, uh, which allows profits. As you pile on more debt and you generate profits, everything goes to the bottom line. Now, you can reduce that significantly. You can reduce it by raising capital requirements very, very substantially, number one. Number two, if you have a deposit facility within your orbit as a holding company, you ought to recognize you have a kind of a responsibility here where the government is insuring the, the, the deposits, and at the same time, indirectly, you're using the strength of that insurance as a way of increasing your liabilities to bring things down to the bottom line. Uh, I think that's completely incorrect. Uh, it also ought to be noted that 
those who are, and I've been in financial markets all my life, uh, and I have the best interests at heart for the well-being of that system, but those who are engaged in financial institutions as traders, as middle management, as such, are in a business where they have no downside risk. The downside, if they do well in a year, they get very good rewards. If in subsequent years they don't do so well, the worst that can happen is they leave and go to another organization. Uh, that's not the way, really, to run financial institution. There's something wrong with a financial and economic system <clears throat> where the profits of financial institutions, the profits of the financial sector, rise increasingly as a proportion of total profits in a country. That isn't right. Financial institutions didn't invent the wheel. They didn't invent Microsoft. They didn't invent any of, of the real activity that's going on. They helped finance it and support it and such. But that this financial sector should increasingly get more and more profits as a percent of total profits in a system is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And that ought to be reordered, not by the government moving in and saying do this or that. To large measure, that can be accomplished by increasing the equity stake that is in that institution. Now, a comment was made before about hedge funds. Uh, hedge funds charge 2 and 20 uh, as such. I don't run a hedge fund, so I have no direct interest in it. But in a hedge fund, there are limited partners and general partners. And when you're a limited partner, you are at risk, period. You are at risk. If the partnership does well, you make more money. If it doesn't do well, as we saw it during the last year or two, your capital goes down. There is no insurance. There is no protection of any magnitude. But think about it. We had money market funds that were being distributed by financial conglomerates and others. And there was always the feeling, well, money market funds are the equal of deposits. But they're not the equal of deposits, as, as we learned. And if the government hadn't intervened and practically insured those money market funds, there would have been a great disaster beyond what has already occurred. So how can, and, and the marketing of a money market fund was in such a way that you believed that it was the equal of a deposit. Uh, somehow the government would protect it. And secondly, there was always the belief you had instant access to that money. That wasn't true, but that was the way it was perceived uh, in the system. That's wrong. And the institutions involved had a lot to do with disguising the role of these activities in such a way that they were user-friendly to the clients. That's wrong. So we have a lot that can be done to straighten out what the rights and the wrongs are in the system. Where's yes, the yes, ma'am. I'm Erica Karp uh, with uh, UBS. And the question is for Mr. Cox and, and the panel. And thank you, by the way. Can you make some comments on the globalization of financial organizations? Um, and Archie, I used to work for you actually 20 years ago at First Boston. But um, you know, the, the opportunity for financial regulation to really be synchronized globally to a greater extent, and especially with kind of consolidation we're seeing cross-border. So anything you might want to share? <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question, and a particularly topical one right now, when when uh, various countries uh, seem to be staking out different positions on the on the subject. Uh, with I guess France right now, Mr. Sarkozy being the furthest on one extreme, and and uh, and others not being, let's say, anywhere near as extreme as that. Uh, very difficult to coordinate. Uh, financial regulation, I think, other than through the BIS, the BAL uh, agreements, uh, the BAL, BAL 1, which is, is followed, but it has certainly been useful, BAL 2. I, I think uh, there will be changes made in those agreements. Those, to me, are the ones that, that, that make the most sense if you're going to try to have some sort of global framework. And I think you need, 
you need some. What, what we don't need is to have regulatory shopping uh, going on. Uh, I, I don't think there is much of that, but, but there's a risk if different countries react differently. It's also will create an uh, uncompetitive landscape for people, which, which uh, would, would be unfortunate. Uh, two most important ones to be somewhat in sync, I think, are the UK and the, and the, and the US, given that, that those are the two major financial centers still. Uh, but we shouldn't forget we shouldn't forget the others uh, as as well. So it's it's a real issue and a real problem. And, and uh, maybe it'll get addressed somewhat this weekend by the G20. I'm not sure. Sir, Jim Riley from Needham and Company. Uh, you've made a very compelling argument that scale is a, a problem uh, and and concentration of, uh, of of assets is a problem. Uh, one of the things that is clear is that the growth engine of this country has been small companies. Uh, and uh, I'd be interested in your perspective on the impact of this concentration of assets uh, at these large institutions on the IPO market. Uh, Intel, Microsoft, you mentioned, they went public as relatively small companies. Uh, and uh, is that even feasible today, given the concentration of holdings amongst the large, uh, large domestic institutions? And if, uh, if that's not possible, how can it be fixed um, so that we can have a thriving uh, growth economy in the U.S.? Well, the, the, the hope is that the Microsofts of the future will be able to find a smaller underwriter more medium-sized underwriter uh, that will pursue this kind of a, a venture. The hope is that uh, we have many of these companies now that seed, that provide investment capital as such. But it is true uh, that very large financial institutions try to systematize their lending and investing operations, and therefore a certain kind of client or uh, may fall through the cracks. It can't get the personal attention that you get when you walk into a medium-sized or smaller institution where you are perceived to be somebody more important than if you walk into a very large institution where the lines of authority are quite, quite a number before you see the top. And the systemizing, having a system and a clearing process uh, that doesn't really fully cope necessarily with the opportunity which you describe. One of the problems here that we have today is the pressure that's on our medium-sized and smaller banks, uh, for, uh, for example. Uh, and what happens to the medium and smaller banks, medium-sized and smaller banks? Well, close them down. Uh, how do you close them down? Well, the FDIC comes in and try to find a buyer probably a larger institution, further concentration as, uh, as, uh, as such. So we're really doing very little to help those communities have a financial institutional environment that is friendly to them. It's just the reverse. S standardize everything through getting big. And uh, I think our government has, been, uh, has done very little uh, really to reverse that trend. Having said that, there, there are these private funds that are out there looking for IPOs to invest in and so on and to nurture them along, which is indigenous to a large extent, or had been indigenous to the United States and is, has, was not apparent in Europe or in Asia and so on. It, it's an American process. It's about the best answer I can give. Archie, you have a comment? Uh, I, I, I think a lot. I, there's two sides to the issue. One, one is the question is, has, has, has the, have the financial institutions gotten bigger, caused that to happen? Or, or, and when you say financial institutions, banks and brokerage and, and investment banks. Well, and, and the, also the, the, other, the asset managers. I, I think the asset manager is the other side of that. They, they have gotten so big that, that, frankly, anything with a market capitalization below uh, and sometimes you think it's below 500 million, but Bill May, maybe it's 200 million, but it's something like that, isn't of much interest to most of the big institutions. Yeah. And, and that, that, is a, that is an issue. As a, as a person who invests in venture capital, I, I uh, uh, understand it. It is a real issue. I think, I think uh, 
Henry's right that there are institutions you can turn to, but but it's you had you do have to be a bigger size today uh, to go public. But uh, yeah, I, I would add a couple of things. In principle, you have Joseph Schumpeter characterized this as creative destruction, and when the great economists of uh, of our our world and our day, uh, but essentially we keep reinventing ourselves. We will reinvent ourselves. And I can see it in our own little business. We are a publicly traded company. We are a long only asset manager. We are going to have the best year we've ever had for new business. We're small compared to Barclays. They got more zeros after what they manage than we do. But the truth is, people are always looking for somebody who has a better way to do things. And very often, it starts with a smaller firm because you're doing something different or you're going to die. And there has to be a transparency to it. You have a vested interest. There's a passion to it. You can find this in smaller firms. I also think if you look at underwritings this year, look at who have been the lead underwriters. Many of these firms I've never heard of before. They were so far down the list of distribution. It's a very different list. We had a firm in Australia, Grant Samuels, being one of the biggest distributors of, uh, of uh, deals uh, this year. So I, I, I do think we, we will reinvent ourselves in this way. In this way. Sir? Uh, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Fernando Lujan. I teach uh, foreign policy at West Point. I'm here with my students. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask the inverse question of what Jim asked. Uh, bearing in mind all the different foreign policy, or all the different economic policy uh, prescriptions that are circulated around Capitol Hill right now, in your opinion, uh, what are the top one or two worst policy initiatives <laughs> you could take in the short term to make things go bad? Thank you. How, how broad can we be? Does have to stay <laughs> and how much time do we have? <laughs> we have spent more time on this health care issue than I think we need. Okay. We should have a gasoline tax in this country. It would be very good for this country. We cannot even discuss it. You want to make America safe? Start to put on a gasoline tax. It's one of my personal. Uh, we cannot talk about it. It's just something that we can't deal with. Uh, you have big policies and something that you're front and center in. You've got a big debate with respect to Afghanistan, that role, the systematic claim that a war has on the resources. I also think two things are happening in this country that's very unfortunate, and one of them has to do with the military. The fact that we have a volunteer army in many ways is unfortunate. We would react very differently if it were the children of the people in this room <coughs> that uh, were taxed with going to war. We have we take a very, hey, it's not my family, it's someone else's. That's wrong. We should have a vested interest in those things. I also think the same thing is, um, is relevant with politicians. There's actually majors in colleges now called career politicians. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, what is a career politician? I'd like to know that somebody worked, understands what it means to have a job, perform a service, then go try and do something good. Our system is broken, and Fareed Zachariah in his book, The Post-War America, it's another must-read, my view. We have such a short-term view among our politicians, we can't deal with 10-year issues, let alone 20-year issues. I'll get off my soapbox. So Archie and uh, Henry, Henry do you, uh, what are the worst ideas that are being bounced around Capitol Hill now? Well, I'll speak just from the financial side of it rather than try to paint a broad issue because a broad issue it would be just as a citizen uh, but uh, I, I think the worst idea in terms of financial reform is to have a separate supervisor and regulator over system risk I think that can't occur effectively because how can that separate system regulator communicate effectively with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the creator of reserves. The Federal Reserve allows debt expansion as, as such. And how can a supervisor that sits on the outside there fully have the intimacy of what the Fed is doing or have the, intim or have the Fed really know what the supervisor is doing? No, you, you can't separate uh, the, uh, those, uh, those responsibilities. It's, uh, it's like somebody on a, on, on a baseball team uh, where he's only a fielder, he's only in the field and never hits uh, uh, as, as such. That's not the way the, the game ought to be played. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I have to say that there is a perception here that you can just establish 
firm rules, firm regulations. No, you can't do that in the financial markets. I think the, rule, the role of a financial regulator is to have a better mousetrap, to build a better mousetrap all the time for the financial system. Because the participants in the financial system will always say, hey, that's the cheese I don't like. Uh, so there, there, there has to be a way of keeping the financial system uh, really on a sound basis. And you can't do that through ongoing quantitative rules and regulations. Go ahead. Right. Ma'am? Paul N. Kirschenbaum, uh, CEO of Chapin Associates, another small money management firm. The American citizens, as well as some citizens around the world, um, are really questioning the veracity and integrity of our financial system. They feel it's been severely impaired by the naked shorting, by the derivatives, by the quadrillion or so that we're still not discussing. What is the business model of the United States and the financial services industry that has to deal with financing the business model of the United States? And how do we get through this? Well, I'm not, when you say a business, I'm not sure the United States has a business model per se. Otherwise, we're a, right now we're a casino. I, I don't really think we are a casino. Really? I, I don't believe that. I, I do think that you had a systemic element, you had a systemic risk pop up that shouldn't really have popped up. There were many, many signs over many, many years with regard to deregulation uh, as, a, as a government policy, a Federal Reserve policy it was a problem, and it intersected with laissez-faire capitalism and an element of laissez-faire capitalism that had to do with compensation. The, this storm came together. Now, at the same time, I think the more we understand it, the, the more the, when you can articulate a problem accurately, the responses and the answers are embedded in the articulation of the problem. That's why I think you need really this commission. I think then you can put in place some of these regulatory issues you need, some of the safeguards. But we can't just fix everything. You kind of people are, are responsible uh, for their behavior. Uh, I think what you can do is set some rules of the road to make sure they're enforced, standards if you will, but then you have to let the free market kind of manage it themselves. I mean, that would be my, my view. I think the danger that we've just done in the United States, we've put on $9 trillion of debt. That's a big deal. Now, I don't know what's, how that's going to play out, but essentially we were looking at Armageddon a year ago. We moved away from that, but we've traded one problem for another. Right. And as someone once told me a long time ago, when you, you never solve a problem, you simply trade one for the other and hope the second one's more manageable than the first. And that's where we are. We hope the second one that's coming our way is more manageable than what we faced a year ago. But I don't think we had a choice. I don't think the government had a choice last year except to do what it did. It was okay. haphazard, but it needed to be done, or we had it. It was over, in my view. Thank you. Ma'am. Uh, Sandra, uh, Sandra Hayes, professor of mathematics, City University of New York. Mr. Cox, I'd like to ask you to please elaborate <clears throat> excuse me, on your remark that credit default swaps did not play as large a role in the current crisis as one often reads. In 2007, there was more money involved in the credit default swap market than the world's GDP. That means there was more money involved in betting than in producing and the bets weren't regulated, there was not enough collateral to honor them. Well, for, for, first of all, I have no problem with credit default swaps being, being traded in a, in a more visible fashion. I, I, all I'm saying is I don't think credit default, I think credit default swaps are, are in many respects misunderstood. And, and like derivatives, they get tarred with being a cause of the problem. Uh, and, and there's some very good things about credit default swaps. And, and I, I, as I said, when, when some major corporations have gone broke, the credit default swaps, just, and they were huge in volume, uh, settled out. There was no, there was no, nobody went broke as a result of credit default swaps not settling out. Um, if if the, the, the attempts to regulate credit default swaps, again, it's the, it's the unintended consequences of doing it. Suppose we as a, as a financial institution, or any financial institution, has exposure to, a, say, an Argentinian uh, uh, corporate c customer. Um, and we want to hedge that exposure somehow. And there's no way of hedging it other than 
than through a sovereign a credit default swap on, on the sovereign credit. Now, is that what people call a, a, you know, a covered or an uncovered, a naked or an unnaked credit default swap? It's the only way to do it. it it's, it's relatively covered, but by definition, some people would put it in the wrong category. I, so. I would agree with Arch on this. You had roughly $62 trillion of derivatives, more than, but when you looked at what those derivatives were, many of them were just currency hedges. They just matched off with one another. It wasn't a big deal. Another, another suggestion would be around in July of every year, the Bank for International Settlements puts out an annual report. It's one of the most boring things in the world. I promise you you'll fall asleep three times before you get to the end of it. But it's very, very if, good. If you get to the end of it. If you get to the end. <laughs> it's very, very good, though. And to me, it's an unbiased picture of the state of the global finance. And to, they had a lot of insights prior to the crash. You could... You, I wrote a book a couple of years ago that, they, that dealt with some of these issues, but a lot of the source data was the 2006 July BIS data. A lot of this was there. You could see some of this. Thank you. Let's, very quickly, yeah. I, go in order. Sorry, you're next. Yes. Don't, don't, no, 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 no. After, after this gentleman, you're she, after him. She's got a bad back. Thanks. Sorry. She's got a bad uh, back. It's hard for her to stand. Okay, go ahead. Oh, please. Sorry. <laughs> could you speak into the microphone? Thank you. Uh, the short covering, which you uh, still don't, uh, you can short without an uptick. And that, I, I think, can cause huge problems and it gives you a tremendous amount of uh, movement of the, of the market. And if you, had an, if you couldn't short without an uptick, it would make a huge difference. And I'm asking you, Mr. Cox, they've been talking about it for few years and nothing sort of has been done. Do they expect to do something about that? Because to me, that's one of the most important things. I, I, would, I would make two comments about that. First of all, um, the, 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 I, I happen to, the, the studies that have been done show that, that, that there's no impact on liquidity and I mean, on the markets. If you'd have an uptick rule or you don't have an uptick rule, I, I, I myself, instinctively think there ought to be an uptick rule, despite what the studies show. The, the bigger problem to me is, is the, the, the naked short selling, that, that there, is, there is a rule that you can't sell short unless you can borrow the stock. Uh, I don't believe that that was enforced uh, at the height of the crisis last summer. That's absolutely correct. And, and I think that is the bigger problem. And, and uh, well, that's good. Yes. But yeah, and, and that, that caused, there's no question that the pressure that was put on the stocks in the financial sector was a, a lot of it came from, from, I won't say organized, although some people would, but from, but from short selling. Uh, and I find it hard to believe that people were short selling in those volumes that were being able to borrow the stock. Uh, so it, it contributed to the crisis without any, of confidence, without any question. No, it, it, I think it would have provided for le, le, less, less instability in the, in the market. And Henry, Mr. Coffin, I must say that the less leverage in these companies, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. 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 Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I was um, confused by Chairman Cox's um, comment or concern that by uh, going towards exchange trading that small and medium enterprises in the oil industry would be squeezed out of hedging. Isn't that, a, isn't that part of the unfortunate uh, evolution of financial terms where they come to mean their opposite, you know, that hedge funds aren't really about hedging? Um, that, um, that because there are already exchange traded uh, commodities in oil and grain, which very small farmers, I mean poor farmers in India, use those exchanges to, uh, to, to trade, to hedge on their crops. So I, I didn't understand your comment. No, no, I, I, I was talking, first of all, most of these contracts, that, that many of the contracts they use are, are unstandard. But whether they're standard or unstandard, I was addressing more the question of if they had to had to clear their trades, not through a dealer like us, who would clear through a central clearing corporation, but if they themselves had to clear directly through a central clearing corporation, 
not, not a question of where the contract is traded. If they have to clear through a central clearing cooperation, then they have to post collateral if there's price movements. They don't have the collateral to, to post. That, that, that would be the impact, uh, that, which would basically mean they wouldn't get the financing. After all, what they're doing is selling forward their production. Um, and, and if they have to post collateral, they don't have the collateral to do it. Uh, so there would be a huge contraction in the volume of financing to the mid-cap uh, energy sector. So uh, we're now going to take a 15-minute coffee break. Back in the room at 1045. Thank the panel for an excellent job. Thank you very much. <laughs>